Praise the Lord. This is Pastor Samuel Morris, pastor of Fountain of Living Waters Church in Queens, New York. You're watching The Oasis, our television outreach program. Praise the Lord. Now, we all know what an oasis is. An oasis is a paradise in the middle of the desert. Amen. What are the two outstanding features of the oasis? The trees and the water. The trees to shade you from the blazing hot sun that was beating down and drying the life out of you and good, refreshing, life-giving water. Amen. Glory to God. When you got born again and came into Jesus, you, were, you came out of the desert and you came into the oasis. But you know, too many Christians uh, come in and get the shade from the tree. Yes, they're, they're going to heaven when they die. Amen. But they never partake of the life-giving waters. They don't get the vibrancy of the Christian life that's supposed to be lived today in the earth. Just like um, a, a traveler in the desert who's hungry, who's thirsty, looks for the oasis, and it's a sign of hope for him, or her, him or her as the case may be. Amen. We as Christians, our life is supposed to be so refreshing and it's supposed to be so vibrant that the people who are still in sin, amen, and if that's you still in sin, we're going to give you the answer to that before the program is over, so stick with us. Amen. Your life as a Christian is supposed to be so vibrant and inviting to the people still in the desert of sin that they want to come in and make Jesus the Lord of their life. Amen. As we go into the word of God, as we study, we are going to learn how to walk in the fullness of everything God has for us. We're going to drink the water. You know, when I was in school, we had a little saying about good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better best. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that God wants us to have days of heaven right here on the earth. So when you get born again, uh, you come under the trees, you get into oasis, you drink the water. Things are supposed to get good and they get. I know this is bad English, but they get gooder and gooder and gooder and better and better and better. Then when we leave this life and go to the next life, amen, then we get the best. Amen. I was watching a program the other day, a nature program, and I was watching the gigantic whales down to the little tiny krill, the little shrimp, the crab, starfish, all the different colored fish. And it came to me with such an impact that the God who created all of this lives inside of me. How can any situation, how can any problem in life defeat me when I have the creator of everything living inside of me? Amen. Let's go to the word of God. Now, when the teaching is over, don't go away because I'm going to be right back. We're going to talk a little bit more. Amen. As the program is playing, you're going to see contact information. Amen. Uh, you can order these broadcasts um, in any format you like. Um, again, use the contact information. Get in contact with us. Amen. Let's go into the word of God. God bless. You. Praise the Lord. Let's get back into the word of God. Now we're talking about grace. We're beginning a new series on grace. Amen. One of the most misunderstood concepts in Christianity. Um, you know, I often say that there's a ditch on either side of the road. Those of you from the South, if you've ever been South, ever been to the Caribbean, um, Africa, foreign country, where they still have dirt roads. Uh, you know you have a ditch on either side of the road for drainage. All right, but it doesn't matter which side of the road, which ditch you get in. If your car, your truck, your wagon gets stuck, you still have a problem. Okay, we have two ditches when, it's, when we deal with grace. One ditch says, um, or people say people say. I've never heard anybody actually say this. But people on... The other side of the ditch are worried that people will get in the ditch where because there's grace and, you know, I can get forgiveness and there's no more sacrifice that I could just do what I want to do and I could ask God to forgive me. If you're living like that, I would say you're not really saved because when you really get saved, when you sin, there is something in you that won't let you be comfortable with it. All right. So I, I have never seen anybody personally, not saying they're, they're not out there, because I haven't been everywhere and I don't know everybody. Amen. But I don't know anybody who's saved, they go to church, 
and they, 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 they just fornicate. They just commit adultery. They just, you know, do all kinds of rob banks, steal from stores, do all kinds of crazy things because they know, oh, Jesus, forgive me, grace, ha, ha, ha. But if you're into that, if there are people like that, that's a ditch on one side of the road. What I have seen more of and I have had more experience with is people on the other side of the um, road. Um, balance is the key of life. You want to stay in the middle of the road. The people on the other side of the ditch are the ones I run into more of. They are so worried that, you know, um, people are going to sin. They, it seems to give them a problem that we are freely justified by grace. No, we got to get in, you know, that's what got Martin Luther in trouble, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, the reformer. Amen. That's what got him into trouble because he told the old folks he was dealing with. He told the Catholic church that salvation is strictly by grace, not by works, not by indulgences. And because they were making a lot of money from those indulgences, um, you look up that word. I'm not going to get into to that uh, if you want to know what indulgence means. Amen. They were making so much money from that that they didn't want to hear what Martin Luther had to say. Amen. But saying penance and, you know, hailing whoever and doing all that kind of stuff, they feel that we got to do something. We got to do something to earn salvation. It can't just be that easy. And it bothers people that we can be free. You know, now this is me. This is me, Pastor Mars. This is me. You cannot intimidate me. You cannot put fear into me and make me think that if I come into church and I'm not standing up 90% of the time that I'm in there, if I'm not making a lot of noise, I'm not waving my hands going crazy, that, you know, I'm not giving reverence to God. I'm not praising God enough. Listen. You know, we have to be careful with um, following what we see other people do without knowing why it's done. You know, praise leaders, you know, just because I don't um, praise the Lord with the same exuberance that you do or what you would like to see me do does not mean I'm not worshiping God. I am worshiping God. I am not praising him to please you. So a lot of times, if I don't feel like standing up, I don't stand up. No, I don't. I am a son of God. A son can sit in his father's presence. I know who my father is. My father is God. But I am not, um, I mean, I know the office. He is God. I know he deserves reverence. I know all of that. But what I'm trying to say is that you telling me that if I don't reverence him when you say I should reverence him, and if I don't reverence him to your satisfaction, then I'm not praising, I'm not, I'm not reverencing him. And, you know, I don't buy that. Grace means I can come in the presence of God and I can sit down because I am a son. Understand, the Bible is an Eastern book. And if you have a good, a, a good understanding um, of Eastern mindsets, it helps. It makes more sense to you. Sitting down um, signifies a number of things in Eastern thought, and some even in our thought. All right? Sitting down means you finish. You rest. When you sit down, that means work is over. You finish. Okay? Sitting down also means that you are in authority. All right? The Bible tells us in Ephesians, and while I'm talking, while I'm doing this little preamble here, get your Bibles. Don't come to the Oasis program without your Bible, because we're going to be, this is an intensive, hands-on, in the Word of God program. The Bible tells us that we are seated together. Seated. We have finished our work. When we accept Jesus, the book of Hebrews says we have to enter into God's rest. And what is God doing? He is seated. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. And the Bible tells us that we are seated, enthroned with Christ. We, along with God, are at rest. We've entered into his rest. So I can sit in his presence. Now, you, you want to get up? 
you want to shout, you want to run around, you want to do that, that's fine. You have absolute freedom to do, do that. And hey, I might get up and take a trip around with you. I have been known to do that. But don't tell me that I have to do it at your command because I'm not worshiping and I'm not serving you. I'm serving God. Don't tell me I have to do it the way you say I have to do it. And if I don't do it on your command, somehow I don't love God enough. I don't reverence God. You know, when you when you resurrect and you have a heaven and hell to put me in, then you tell me how, when and why I should worship and the way I should. But other than that, leave me and leave people alone. OK. Grace gives us great and marvelous privileges, both spiritual and natural, okay? And what we're going to endeavor to do across the next couple of broadcasts is look at grace in depth so that you won't be on one side of the ditch, one side of the road where, you know, you just sin, 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 because Paul did say, what shall we sin that grace may abound, God forbid. But he's talking to people at the beginning of Christianity who didn't understand how this worked. We've been at this for about 2,000 years now, so we know that that's not why grace came, just so we can sin. We know grace came to get us out of sin. We understand that. So the folks on the other side of the ditch, of the other in the ditch on the other side of the road, get out of that ditch and stop being so worried about people, you know, they're going to sin and you got to keep a tight rope on them and all of that kind of stuff. So we're going to start at the beginning. I think that's a good place to start. And that's going to be Ephesians 2. You should have um, your Bibles by now. Okay. First of all, let's start at the beginning. We are saved by grace. All right. Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are we saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, yes, grace is the gift of God. But what a lot of people miss is that faith is also the gift of God. Amen. Paul says, the life I live, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we live by the faith of God. God gives us the faith in order to access his grace. Y'all understand me? All right, so we are saved by grace. Let's do, I love doing word definitions. Okay, those of you who know me know that. Let's, let's examine this word saved because it's gonna come up later on. We in the Pentecostal charismatic movement limit the word saved to mean born again. When people ask, are you saved? They say, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost and all that good stuff. What they're really saying is I'm born again. And what they did is they have limited salvation to the born again experience. Now the born again experience is a component of salvation. It is the major component of salvation, but it is not the only component of salvation. You know, when you're making a cake, the major component is going to be flour, milk, and water. Yeah, but if you don't put a one egg in there, if you don't put a little baking soda or a little baking powder in there, if you don't put a little sweetener in there, a little sugar, a little corn syrup, a little molasses, it's not going to taste right. So yeah, the majority, the biggest component of salvation is the born again experience. But the reason so many people, and this is um, the focus of uh, this program to help you get into the old aces and drink the water, the reason so many people um, are not drinking the water is because they don't know that healing is in the word salvation, soteria or sozo in the Greek and yasha in um, Hebrew. And they both mean the same thing, different words, but they mean the same thing. Yasha in the Old Testament and Sozo, uh, Soteria in the New Testament is translated at different times. Health, prosperity, welfare or faring well, not the welfare that we think about, you know, people 
you know, on public assistance, not that welfare. It's faring well. It's translated health, success. All of these, um, rescue, deliverance, to open wide, like if you're in a trap, if you're in jail, and Jesus came, salvation, he opened wide the door so you can get out. All of these things are a part of salvation. So when he says, by grace, we are saved, that means it's through grace we are born again, number one. That's the beginning, first step. By grace, we are healed. We are made healthy in our body. By grace, our marriages, our homes, our children, our family. By grace, our finances. Everything that Satan messed up when he entered into the earth realm through Adam, amen, Jesus came back, the last Adam came back and fixed it all. Now, you want to argue that, you know, Everything is not fixed, and, you know, um, we still got to go through and climb up the rough side of the mountain. Fine, go ahead. You are free to do that. But don't trouble me when I find out that the Word of God says I don't have to go through that, and I decide to take the Word of God, um, take God at His Word in the Word, and live according to everything that He says I can have. And then when I get it, you know, don't get mad at me. Don't be a hater. Um, what you're supposed to do is if you see us working for me, you come over and find out what I'm doing to make it work, and you join me. If you have something going on, I see it's working for you, I'm going to come over and ask you, you know, how do you do that? Because I'm not, it's not working for me. Show me how to do it. All right, so it's by grace that we enter into so sozo, into soteria. It's by grace. Okay, now you got to stick with me. I don't want to jump ahead of myself because we're going to define grace. Well, we're going to define it now, but we're going to really get into some finer points later on. All right, now grace is in the New Testament, in both the Old and the New Testament, the same words that are translated into English grace are also translated favor, they're translated gift, and they're translated grant. The word grace is translated favor, it's translated gift, and it's translated grant. Okay, so the, we are saved by favor. We are saved as a gift. It's a gift that's given to us. We are saved by it being granted to us. No work involved. No work involved. The only thing you have to do is say, I accept. Yes, I take it. Somebody said it like this. They said Jesus appeared to them and he had a, a tray of cookies. And he said, have a cookie. And the person said, well, I don't really, I don't eat sweets. I don't really feel like it right now. And Jesus said to him, have a cookie. The correct response is, I believe I will. Think about it. Somebody offers you something. Would you like to have a nice cold drink of water? I believe I will. Yes. Amen. That is the answer. That's the only work. I believe I will accept it. That's the only work involved. Now, I didn't say there was, wasn't hard work involved, but Jesus took care of the hard work. He left it for us easy. Only thing we have to do is receive what he has already done. Okay. We are saved by grace. And if you look at Romans chapter uh, five. Now, you know, we're just, this is the first um, episode of this series. So we, we're just doing a broad overview. But again, we're going to get into specifics. We're going to get into specifics. Stay with me. Stay with me. All right. We are saved by grace. Okay. So now that we're saved and, and for a lot of you out there, that's where you are. You're saved by grace. All right but you are not enjoying the fullness of the oasis. You're under the trees, out of the sun, but you're not drinking of the water. You're still thirsty. You're still miserable. Listen, this is going to shock some of you, but God means for us to be happy in this life. Happy. Enjoy every day. And remember, you know, everybody say long time ago, long time ago. All right. Well, ooh, we, I, 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 22 22, 22 years now, 20, oh no, it can't be 32. This was back in the 80s. Oh my goodness, time is passing. 30 something years ago, I worked for this company. See, when you're telling a testimony and not a testimony, you can name names and give dates. I was working at this company called Tempo Sonics out in Plainview in Long Island. And 
my boss, my manager, my immediate supervisor, name was Ray, and his wife's name was Little Deer. And Ray and Little Deer worked together there in the company. Mm -hmm. And they would go out to lunch together, and another um, fellow employee who lived across the street for them said, not only do they work together, not only do they go to lunch together, but they go shopping together, they go bowling together. You never see one without the other one. And me growing up, you know, being married and having a wife and all of that, we used to hear things like, you know, the old ball and chain and um, women are like elephants. Um, I like to look at them, but I wouldn't want to own one, things like that, you know, and the married guys at work, um, you know, work was a place to get away from the wife, especially if she was a um, housewife and she was at home. You came to work, a lot of times the guys will come to work even if they weren't feeling good because work was the escape from the wife. So that's the kind of mindset I had. And then I see Ray and Little Deer and I could not understand that because that was so foreign to me. But this is what Grace will do. Now I'm married. And I have my own business, my wife and my son, when he's not in school, they work with me in my business. I am literally with my wife 24 hours a day. I'm here doing this taping and she's in the same building that I am in here now. You know, some of you men and some of you wives, y'all can, you know, be with them 24 hours. Yeah, 24 hours a day. This is the kind of life grace will give you. I get so much joy just riding with my wife now. Our car has the um, the cab, uh, not the um, bench seats. We have the, you know, the bucket seats. So I'm in my individual seat and she's in hers. Amen. So, you know, we can't do no sliding across lovey-dovey stuff, which you shouldn't be doing when you're driving anyway. Amen. But I look at her, look over at her, and we're just driving around, going, doing things. The bright sunshine, the beautiful trees, a pleasant day, a rainy day. Amen. But every day, every minute is a joy. This is what grace does. This is the life that grace gives you. Um, you know, I'm sitting here doing this right now. I'm not trying to do this right now thinking about what I'm going to do two hours from now. No, every moment, whatever I'm doing, any moment, grace allows me to enjoy what I am doing this moment. You know, it's not such a drudgery and such a bear that I want to hurry up and get out of this moment and get to the next moment. No, grace allows you to live like a king. Don't believe me? Let's look at the word of God. Romans 5 and 17 says this, for if by one man's offense, Adam's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and, ab and it's applied the abundance of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. In the Amplified Bible, says, that says they shall rule and reign in life as kings. Rule and reign in life. That means you're in charge of your situation. What is real freedom? Being really free is more than not being locked up in a jail cell or being um, owned by another person. No, real freedom is when your life is under your control. That's real freedom. Amen. Glory to God. Um, all right. I don't want to say that right now. And I don't want y'all to get mad and flick the TV off yet. Not yet. Not yet. All right. So we, if we accept the grace, we accept the grace. We reign in this life. We accept the abundance of grace and the abundance of the gift of righteousness. All right. So the grace is the gift and the righteousness is the gift. Why is that and so important? That's important because we get righteousness and holiness mixed up. They are two totally different separate things. We are justified, freely justified, freely declared righteous by faith. 
When we accept the grace of God, being declared righteous comes along with us. We are righteous because God declares us righteous. Now, in the book of Romans, which we're going to get to later, it talks about God imputing or counting you righteous. We were imputed, uh, rather God imputed, he counted us, he applied righteousness to us. Not that we did anything, he just declared us righteous because we're in Christ Jesus, all right? Now, that's righteousness. You have to be righteous before you can be holy. They are not the same thing. Holiness is behavior, okay? Holiness is behavior. And a good way to get a good handle on it is like this. We don't keep the Ten Commandments, holiness, to be saved, made righteous, we keep the Ten Commandments, holiness, because we are righteous. You see the difference? We don't keep the Ten Commandments to be righteous. We keep the Ten Commandments because we are righteous. Keeping the Ten Commandments is behavior, holiness, trying to earn it, and Jesus came to abolish that. So all of you working, trying to get God to please you, you're wasting your time because God is already pleased with you. Praise the Lord. I hope you enjoyed the teaching today. Uh, if you like a copy of today's program, just use the um, contact information that's appeared on your screen. Get in contact with us. Amen. Um, Get in contact with us also if you would like to join us, uh, be a part of a ministry, be a part of this great teaching. Amen. Give us a call and we'll give you the pertinent information about where, when, how, why, and all that good stuff. Amen. If you are not born again, let me invite you to come out of the desert of sin. Amen. Because you're going to die out there. Amen. Glory to God. But Jesus came so that you can have life. If you're tired, if you're sick, sick and tired of living the way you've been living, and uh, getting beat up by the devil, it's easy. Uh, let me change that. It's not easy. Jesus did the hard part. Uh, he left the easy part for us. All you have to do is accept him. Something as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, take my life and do something with it. Something as simple as saying, Lord, I know um, that I'm a sinner and I need help. I can't save myself. I ask you to forgive me. Wash me in your blood. Come into my life and be my Lord. It's as easy as that, my friend. And listen, if that's the decision you've made today, you took the first step on a journey of a thousand miles. You need to be in a good church home. Wherever you are in the United States, you give us a call and we will be able to direct you to a good church in your area. Until next time, this is Pastor Samuel Morris and the Oasis. God bless you.